Hello, a very good morning to you. It is a Tuesday, the 13th September, and you are watching Ireland Ahead. You are indeed. We're waking you up with country crooners, sports superstars, and all the highlights. He's got to talk about Garth Brooks for five days. We're doing the Emmy Awards in just a little while. Oh God, still got for me. more Garth. We do come. have Garth today as well. Uh, standing by, yes, to round up the winners, the losers, and the playing hard done by from last night's Emmys is entertainment.ie's Brian Lloyd. I'm delighted. Sun, Sunday, Sunday. That yes, is Sunday. Well done. That's Sunday. Uh, later this hour, super fan and Virgin Media reporter Paul Quinn tells us about a brand new. I can't believe you didn't get to do this. A Garth Brooks documentary coming your way tonight on Virgin oh, Media no. Television. No, like, how did he get that? He gig? got to go to Nashville. Not did you fair. not bring someone up and go, I lads? I cannot believe it. Uh, looking awesome. forward to catching up with Paul later on. Plus, football star Stephanie Roach gives us the inside track on Ireland's World Cup chances. Now it's time to say good morning to our Derrico. Hi, Derek, how are you doing? Good morning, team. A bit of a breezy start up here in County Loud, but with some really nice sunshine on the cards out there this Wednesday. But guys, we've come up here to Carlingford in the Wee County because we are off to check out an oyster farm. It is run by husband and wife team, and we have timed the tides just perfectly on this one. So we're going to be taking you from shore to door in terms of their, uh, their production. But can we swing the camera around here and take a look at these beautiful opening shots? We've Shlee Foy there behind me, out across uh, to King John's Castle and ending up across Carningford Lock to Ross Trevor there in County Down. Doesn't that look absolutely beautiful on a Wednesday morning? Stunning over there, Derek. Uh, you're going to have to get the boat. You can, there's a boat that goes across and stuff as well. Gorgeous, yeah, absolutely. You know, I think I am, yeah. We'll, we'll get it later on. We'll see what we'll do. <laughs> sure. Bring us back some oysters as well. I, okay, I thanks feel so he much, needs Derek. a pink feather boa and stuff. I always associate hen parties. A lot of hen oh, parties yeah, in Carlingford. Carlingford. Yeah, stay away. Sorry to the people of Carlingford for that. <laughs> right, time to get the news. Over to you, Hannah Murphy. Thanks, Tommy, and good morning. Well, a memorial has been set up outside a school in County Westmeath as Gardaí continue to investigate the circumstances surrounding the deaths of two young children in Multifarnham last Friday. Five-year-old Thelma Deneni and her two-year-old brother Michael died after a car fire on a rural road outside of Multifarnham village. Their mother is currently being treated in hospital for her injuries after the incident. Yesterday, the Garda Commissioner Drew Harris confirmed that the deaths are being treated as suspicious. The President, the Taoiseach and the Minister for Foreign Affairs will attend a service of reflection on Queen Elizabeth II's life in Northern Ireland today. It's one of a number of events taking place during a visit by King Charles and the Queen Consort who are due to fly into Belfast City Airport later. They're expected to meet with Stormont party leaders during the trip and visit an exhibition on the late Queen's long association with Northern Ireland at Hillsborough Castle. In Washington, the U.S. Vice President has told civil rights and reproductive justice groups that the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade has created a health care crisis in America. The groups told Kamala Harris that the abortion landscape in the United States is out of step with the rest of the world, with a number of states set to impose new restrictions and outright bans. It comes months after the U.S. Supreme Court decided during the Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization case to overturn Roe v. Wade, essentially taking away the constitutional right to a termination. With the Supreme Court having made the decision in Dobbs to take a constitutional right that had been recognized from the people of America, from the women of America, has created a health care crisis in America and has highlighted the fact that, as we all know, we must be vigilant and we must stand shoulder to shoulder. And this moment, post-Dobbs, highlights the fact that we still have a lot of work to do. Back at home, Ireland's national autism charity says there were families reaching out to their service as late as last week because their children still couldn't secure a school place. The minister with responsibility for special education announced that an extra 383 special classes would open this school year to help accommodate all students. But as I am says problems remain with families having to travel long distances to get to school and not always having access to the full supports that they need. A father of two living in South Tipperary has told The Tonight Show that his children still aren't sure if they will have a therapist to support them. The starting point here has to be what the Ombudsman for Children said last June, 
that there's discrimination towards these kids when they don't receive services. And something that you don't hear very often is that there's permanent damage being done when they don't get the services. And I suppose, without being, you know, using loaded language, they're not cattle. These are real children that just can't be herded into a classroom uh, under circumstances where they're not getting the proper therapist. And finally, for now, ahead of his final Croke Park performances, Virgin Media News will air a special documentary tonight looking back at Garth Brooks' early career, his love affair with Ireland and the fallout from the five-in-a-row fiasco. It's his last ever stadium tour and he's ending it in Dublin. Garth Brooks has already played three nights at Croke Park ahead of his final two performances this weekend. But Garth was planning a Dublin comeback for some time. I remember being in his dressing room uh, before one of the shows in 2019 when he said, we're going to do these for three years and we're going to end the stadium tour in Ireland. And I could tell the look on his face when he said that, how special this is to him that he's returning to Ireland. In a special Virgin Media News documentary to air tonight, we meet his super fans in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and look at his love affair with Ireland, including the early days in Nashville with those who co-wrote some of his biggest hits, including If Tomorrow Never Comes. And this was his second single and his first number one. So it's just like magic upon magic to me on how that all happened. Garth Brooks' five nights in Crow Park brings an end to his last ever stadium tour in the place he feels most at home. Paul Quinn, Virgin Media News. And Garth Brooks Coming Home airs tonight at 9 o'clock here on Virgin Media 1 and the Virgin Media Player. For car insurance, van insurance or home insurance, call the Quote Devil. Unless, of course, you've got money to burn. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. We're coming to you live here from Carlingford in the Wee County. It's all about sea loud here this morning as we see, eat and admire our way through this neck of the woods. In fact, we're heading off to an oyster farm uh, later on this morning. So that's all to come into the next hour. Anyway, let's take an opening look at weather together. Now, with Conan Doyle with us on cameras this 13th of September, and I have to say, what a beautiful start we have here in uh, County Loud this morning. Elsewhere, we are seeing a mainly dry and settled start with some nice sunshine now breaking through to kickstart your Wednesday breakfast time. A little bit breezy out there this morning, light to moderate there from the north, especially off southern coast. Now right across the day in fact a pretty decent day in store we're going to see some lovely sunshine kick through from many parts. A little bit cloudier through uh, southern parts of Cork and into Kerry but elsewhere that sunshine winning now towards the back end of the day. Top temps of about 15 to 19 degrees. Finally then tonight it looks like a bit of cloud cover pulling through across the northern half of the island. The first the south we think it will clear out very similar to last night we're going to see a little bit of mist and fog trail around feeling in its way into your thursday morning and in fact a cooler night in store too with values back to about five to ten degrees so that's how we're shaping up here in carlingford in county loud at the moment we'll catch again back live at 7 35. For first-time drivers, young drivers, returning drivers, if you've had an open claim or have had too many penalty points. The quote devil's always got one hell of a it's time now to take a look at this morning's papers. We're starting with the Daily Mail. Their headline reads, Waiving school travel fees, a mistake. Thonish Sully of Ragger has reportedly privately told his party it was a mistake to waive school transport fees as thousands of children across the country have been left without a spot on the school bus. Government told to treble PRSI rate for self-employed and farmers. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. A huge increase in the rate of PRSI paid by the self-employed is recommended by an expert group set up to advise the government on the tax and welfare systems. The Mirror's headline reads, Car Fireball Murder Probe. Gardaí are now treating the deaths of two children in a horrific car fire in Westmeath as murder. The Herald also leads with that car blaze suspect to be quizzed. The Star leads with tears for lost angels. RTE broadcaster Ryan Tuberty yesterday visited the scene of the Tala tragedy where twins Christy and Chelsea Cawley and their sister Lisa Cash were killed. The Irish Times headline, more electricity credits in budget likely. The government is likely to opt for more electricity credits rather than seeking to cap householders and businesses' bills, according to Minister for Public Expenditure Michael McGrath. 
The examiner leads with 200 euro cuts to monthly crash charges. Parents are likely to see their childcare costs decline by 200 euro per month next year and a further 200 euro per month the following year after an agreement was reached between the government parties ahead of the next budget. And finally, the Sun's front page is Dancing with the Stars is canned. The paper reports that RT bosses have told Dancing with the Stars producers the show will end after the next season. The can can the can can. No, you missed it. I can't look at you. I can't look at you. I can't look at you. Well, coming up next, we're going to be discussing all the top stories. It's not going to be the can can, is it? No, it's. Are you announcing? Are you in the final series of Dancing with the Stars? Is this how we lighten up the mood this morning? Is it you? It's not me. After his moves at Garth Brooks, guys, he'd be amazing. I definitely will not be getting an odd. Yes, it's all the top stories coming up after the break. Good morning, you're very welcome back. Now from budget leaks to recycling targets. How exciting is that? <laughs> wow. you want to go back to welcome us? back. Good morning. Do you want to come back to us pretending really you're doing dancing with on. the stars, is it? The communication clinic's Terry Pro is here with today's top stories. We're gonna be talking about washing out your plastics in a minute, Terry. But first, let's talk about uh, all the leaks that we are getting in the papers. It's two weeks from the budget. So yes. we've got a lot of news coming through today and indeed yesterday. And this, I suspect, is going to match all previous budgets in the sense that it will have no surprises, whatever, only minor disappointments because expectations have been brought up so high. Uh, well, do you think that, because it, you reckon that there's going to be no surprise because of all these leaks? Mm. Yeah, mm. so, but I mean, do you think that the government are going to do enough? Do you think that people are going to be happy enough with what they're offering? Because so far, you know, we're seeing over in the UK they're going to put caps in. But as opposed to this, it looks like it's just kind of being good to the people, putting money in their pockets. Well, the thing is, do you want 200 euro this way or do you want it that way? That's the difference for the customer in the caps versus uh, giveaways. So why do they pick this way? It's it's interesting. Michael Just to let McGrath, everyone clear, what's going to happen is that there's going to be three instalments of 200 euro for electricity. So this is a credit that's going to be given to everyone next year. So that's going to be 600 quid that the government are going to give us for electricity. As opposed to the British situation where Liz Truss is saying she's going to cap the uh, electricity yeah. supply system, so that, but to the same effect. The, uh, because Minister this is all for taxpayer. Pub like, this is not, there's no windfall taxes being put on energy companies like there is in Germany. This is all, okay, so we're going to give you the taxpayer money and you're also going to pay for it as well. We're going to make it a bit easier for you to survive this autumn. Mm. And Michael McGrath would maintain that uh, he is, his method, is not going to cause the level of borrowing, or indeed any borrowing, but certainly not the level of borrowing that Liz Truss's administration faces by putting a cap on it. Do not ask me a supplementary question on this. <laughs> I don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you, Terry, neither do I. So let's move on to childcare fees. I know about those, and I know how blooming blo blo expensive they are. Can I ask people are. how they, because we have in Europe, we, we've seen that Germany have decided to do the the windfall tax on energy companies. This is the decision that they have made. We are not doing that here. Just wondering what you make of that 096 111 Can I add one thing to it? When you look at energy companies yep. in Ireland, you're looking at whatever is the equivalent these days of the ESB taking in energy from elsewhere as well as from our own generators. And so it's not the evil big fuel companies that uh, the minister could come down, come down heavily on, on. Like for has Shell been happening and stuff. It, would yeah. be, it would be an awful lot of renewable companies that yes. that would be happening to, like wind farms and everything like that. And Absolutely. that's what they said could put them out of business. But let's talk about the childcare fees because this could be a big help to parents out there who are paying on average 800 euro a month to put their kids so that they can go to, to, to work. So it looks like they're gonna get 200 euro a month with another 200 euro next year. This is astonishing. It is on the front page of my own paper, The Examiner, 
And the good news for readers is that there's four separate names, four separate writers on it, the political editor, all sorts of people. So we assume that they're hanging their hat on this, they're fairly sure it's going to happen. Is, because is that what that it means? is an, well, there's a lot of people yeah. guilty if it doesn't happen. <laughs> um, there's, it means an enormous amount because the kind of average childcare cost is about 800 a month. You multiply that by the months and you're talking about just under 10,000 a year. Yeah. Now, if you take 200 a month off that, starting next month, according to this yeah. report, that's a hell of a difference. That's a, oh my God, this is going to be possible. Uh, mm -hmm. reaction and then another 200 on top of that next year effectively has that it, so that they're moving Roderick O'Gorman yeah. and the the story says that he has got a cent from cabinet for this Roderick O'Gorman has promised to have the cost of childcare and it looks like he might be actually Excellent. doing he's, it he's and, got I mean, the they talk about this uh, in terms of childcare being one of the biggest Contributor, contributors to the gender pay cap because they say generally it's women who have to stay home with kids, they can't go to work, therefore this opens up this par or this uh, difference between the two. So it can only be a good thing. This. Absolutely. I mean, we now have to see, is it a really good thing or a flying the kite good thing? Okay. Yeah, because it's 2,800 next year and then it'll be 2,800 the year after is what they want to do and that'll be, you know, over 5,000 uh, euro that's going to be there for people over the next two years, which would be huge Humongous. if they can do that and then hopefully the fees will stay the same there's they're all buying into that uh, 0896 111 one. we're going to move yeah. on to our, our plastic recycling rates in Ireland they have been criticized it's in the times it's in the daily mail and it's in um the examiner as well as to we're doing well but then when it comes to plastics we're doing badly in Ireland it's an amazing thing we're doing really well and the EU is saying good on you yeah. um, except for plastics mm. and the way I understand it from this is that a huge amount 71 percent of our plastics end up in incineration now I hear you say, but that is not a choice made by consumers mm -hmm. who have the plastics. But it may be an inadvertent choice made by consumers in the sense that I suspect it is that an awful lot of plastic gets incorrectly recycled yeah. at the green bin level. And the EPA, are now, I think it's the EPA, are now looking for incentives to encourage homeowners to recycle better, to segregate their stuff so that less of it goes to incineration. Because at the moment, we're just in the fail class on that yeah. one. Yeah. It I mean, wants fiscal and regulatory measures, uh, is the EPA. But the thing is, we were talking about this this morning. The amount of plastic when you go shopping, everything, there's an avocado is in a plastic, some strawberries, they're in plastic. You're getting some apples, you're putting them in a plastic bag. Like, the amount of plastic that is on our shop shelves. They're saying approximately 225 kilograms of waste packaging generated per person yeah. in 2020. Yeah. It's do you, insane. Do you wash your yogurt tubs? No, well, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Are we yogurt all pots, the right thing? just things like that, washing them out, taking the film off, separating the hard plastic and the soft plastic. Yeah. Even though they'll go, they'll, they'll go into the same bin, you have to separate them. There's, there's quite a lot to it, but it looks like Saving we're just not doing it. Saving the planet is costly in behaviour terms, I will But have I'm trying you know. to save the water and cleaning them as well. <laughs> hey, listen, let's get to our final story then. Um, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Garda, here we go. So the Japanese, uh, the, the guards that want to be trained in Japanese martial arts. Yes, I can't pronounce the thing, can you? Uh, Taiho, ju Taiho Jutsu. Fair dues to you. Fair dues <laughs> but do you know to you. what it is, which I think is quite uh, concerning, is that it's actually a martial arts to disarm people with uh, who are armed yeah. with weapons. So this is obviously something that the guards are seeing as becoming a real problem now. Yes. Is that when they're coming into confrontations, people have got batons or knives or, or guns or whatever else, which is quite scary. It's extremely scary. And the, the reason for this thing, this is a, has an interesting history. It goes back to uh, the Middle Ages and has had that level of track record. But what's interesting about it is it's not lethal. You're not setting out to kill the opponent. You're simply setting out to disarm the opponent. Yeah. And so the guard that you have put out a tender to say, if you know how to train people in this particular form of martial arts, 
come and talk to us. Lads, I can't wait to see this in Templemore. All lined out in the pouring rain, learning how to do uh, Taiho Jutsu. Have fun, new guards. Uh, to be fair, because they're using pepper spray. Just in June alone, they had to use pepper spray 95 times and use their baton 22 Shoot, times. There was a guard who had, to, they had his nose uh, yeah. broken at the Garth Brooks Frightened. concert, Matt. Um, uh, Terry Brown from the Communications Clinic, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We very much appreciate it. 0896 111 to get in contact, especially about the annoying recycling. That's what we were all talking about this morning the things that you, the jobs you hate the most. Cleaning out the ogre pots. Now, succession, Ted Lasso, his life is tough. And Squid Game were the big winners at the 74th Emmy Awards. We're going to have all the highlights coming up on Ireland AM. There were tears, so many. Oh my God, I want to thank God. There was <laughs> laughter and there were some shocks. But sure, that's all pretty standard for any award ceremony, really, isn't it? Last night, the 74th Emmy, like 74, really? <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? Took place in LA, and here's just a snippet of where you see this of what happened. If you don't know what Squid Game is, it's a contest you enter when you're in massive debt and desperate for money. Joining the cast next season, Netflix. Thank you. It really is such uh, a pleasure and a privilege for me to play this bonkers gift of a role. It's saying stop now in big letters. I don't know if that's this speech or in general. Either way, it's a fair point. <laughs> Jimmy couldn't be here tonight. <laughs> Come time down. These women were filming this television show that would change their lives forever. They are Emmy Award winning superstars who are going on a world tour. Make some noise for my big girls. Excuse me, sir. Can we get you a drink or something? Uh, you know what? Can I get a good burger? Oh! Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you uh, uh, again so much. Thank you so much. Yes, entertainment. Is Brian Lloyd is here to give us a run through of that. <laughs> the actual look of dis <laughs> like just complete disinterest, Tommy. For, it's... for most people, the entertainment industry is huge. You watch television, yeah, right? Huge. I know you don't care. But there was if they a win time. Awards. There was a time when people looked forward to the Oscars and the Emmys. I don't think so anymore. Because did they? there's no crack unless you got Colin Firth or Olivia Will or yeah. Coleman giving a speech. It was a bit po faced it last was night. Very, very much so. Like this is the first time that the Emmys has been back properly mm. um, since the pandemic, and everyone was just like making up for lost time in terms of like you know the fashion on the red carpet, doing all that jazz. I know that's your thing. And then <laughs> <laughs> I saw you watching I was, my Instagram I know I was. Last of course night. it was. Of course it was. I was watching. Who was, it was the best dress? Um, it was either Zendaya or Elle Fanning were fantastic. Absolutely. Gonna wow. take, gonna take your word. Yeah. Yeah. Gonna take your Andrew word Garfield that. for the boys. Amazing. The white, though. Do you not think the white was a bit ridiculous? No, like, he looks so good. Okay. You wouldn't want to be going near red Come wine. On. But, All right. you know. Talk to us then. Who did well? Big winners. Big winners. Well, obviously, Succession uh, won out uh, in quite a few categories. The other big winner was Ted Lasso. Um, and then the other big winner was Euphoria. So the thing about the Emmys is, is like compared to like the Oscars or even the Golden Globes, the Emmys is actually pretty easy to predict. Like there's very, very, very few um, upsets with it. Now, there was one big upset in this. That was uh, Lee Jung Jae winning Best Actor in the Drama. He won uh, for a Squid, Squid Game. Game. Mm -hmm. People were expecting Bob Odenkirk to win for Be Better Call Saul because that was in its final season. And generally speaking, when it comes to the Emmys, if a show is in its final season, you, you can just expect it to them. Yeah, you kind of do. That's kind of it. It's like, oh, you've done all these great, like, you've gone seven seasons. You absolutely deserve an Emmy now. So it's you know? like a Lifetime Achievement Award. Yeah, totally. Just for what you've done. Just, I, well, not because you're the best, no. but just. 
Just okay. you, la you lasted this long, you deserve it. It's like Sandra Bullock, like when she won for like uh, the Blind Side and the, the blind Oscars. Side. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like she wasn't winning for the Blind Side. She was winning for the because she's that, Sandra Bullock. Because she's Sandra Bullock, and she's you know was still hanging on in there. Like. What and she it, did in Speed. Well, like, I mean, I would have given her the Oscar for Speed. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest. She Jesus was amazing Christ, in Speed. What are you talking she about? So but it was, she won it for but Speed. But it was like when Peter O'Toole got given his honorary Oscar, yeah. and he was like, I wanted a real one. Yeah, know, like Lawrence of Arabia, Venus, any of the films he did. Is that why? Leonardo DiCaprio won eventually. For The Revenant? Yeah. Yeah, again, it like... it was rubbish, but there's so many other good films. <laughs> <laughs> like, The Aviator, I thought he could have won for to that. To be fair, The Bear was under 25, so it's all within Leonardo's Ooh, weird house. Topical. <laughs> topical, I know, I know. Okay, let's go on to... We're going to talk about the drama, we're going to talk about the comedy. So Ted Lasso has been a runaway yeah. hit for Apple TV. It got a lot of people to subscribe mm. to it because it was a little bit of joy during lockdown. Jason Sudeikis had another big night last yeah. night. Yeah. Jason Sudeikis, you buy it? No, I don't buy it at all. I think his whole aw shucks thing is just completely false. And that's not even going into the whole Olivia Wilde divorce thing. I just think, generally speaking, there is something about him that I just find completely inauthentic. And I know people love Ted Lasso. And I they think, like him. But oh, it was... so, yeah, see, that's it. Oh, everyone loves Ted Lasso. No, but I love Jason Sudeikis. Or... I think so... he's very funny. Yeah. I do think he's very funny. But this whole kind of like, oh... But pre-Ted make... Lasso, no one thought this about him. When yeah. he was doing all the movies with Jennifer Aniston and when yeah. he was in Saturday yeah, Night Live, everyone birds. was like... Big, okay, whatever. Kind of, yeah. But now since Ted Lasso, it's like he's had a personality transplant and we love him. Exactly. And like, okay, look, fair play, people can change and if he has, great and fair play. Uh, so yeah, Ted Lasso won uh, in a couple of categories. Yeah. Um, Brett Goldstein won Best Support in Comedy for playing Roy Kent. Um, Roy Keane, in, in well, other Roy words. Keane, yeah. I mean, you said it, but yeah, it's Roy yeah, Keane. It's Roy Keane. Um, Jason Zudek has obviously won in the lead role and then the series won for uh, Best Comedy Series as well. So did great. I mean, those are the big categories to win in their field and they won them all. Uh, when we move on to, because we've got two that did really well, Succession, which is an ongoing series yeah. that everyone, it's the massive hit for yeah. HBO after Game of Thrones. Like, absolutely. It's just put Rupert Murdoch's family on screen. So it had yeah. another night last, great night last night. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, Matthew McFadden won for playing Tom Omgan and completely deserved. I mean, the last season of Succession, he just ran away with it. He was just acting everybody mm -hmm. off the screen. Uh, won in the best drama series as well. Again, completely deserved. Yeah. Um, it's surprising though. I really would have thought Brian Cox might have got a look in somewhere. The along scientist. The way. No, not the scientist. <laughs> Come on. Oh my God. Come on, Tom. Okay. Jeremy Strong didn't get a look in either again. But I mean, look, Matthew McFadden, I'm delighted he won. He absolutely yeah. deserved it. Yeah, the White Lotus it. did really well. Yeah, it did, didn't it? Yeah. Now, the interesting thing about this is the White Lotus was in there for best limited series. Yeah. But now they're making a second season of it, which is kind of like, that's kind of a bit of a cod, like, yeah. you know. But Can whatever. we just talk about Zendaya? She won out best actress as well. Yeah, Big for one. Euphoria, yeah. Um, she's just having a great run of it, in fairness. Like, and Euphoria is just one of those shows that, like, has become really, really buzzy. I mean, not just with, like, Gen Z and the TikTokers and all that kind yeah. of jazz, but, like, just with all audiences. Like, I think the way that it's written and the way that it's filmed is incredible. And it really is a very... Uh, intense yes. examination of like you know drugs and what that has on people and addiction and all that sort of stuff um, and you know like it spawned like I mean obviously there's Zendaya but the you know the cast as Sydney well Sydney Sweeney from the Light, White Lotus they're, they're all they're all so that's well. what I'm saying to you yeah it's mm. become a kind of bit of a, of a pod for um, actors to come out of yeah okay is it worth it watching it Euphoria no the, the, oh, the Emmys. Emmys I think so Tommy what, give us a f out of five Oh, right, four, <laughs> three out of five, three out of five. I'll take that, to be yeah, fair. That's, it's worth uh, a watch. Like, Brian Lloyd Mark. from Entertainment Daddy, great to have you with us. Thank, Thank you. Three out of five, to be fair. Thank this you so much. This man would get a five out of five, though. He's got friends in low places and every county across Ireland. We're going to look ahead to tonight's new Garth Brooks documentary. Oh, no more Garth Brooks. <laughs> there we go, thank five. you. <laughs> See ya. Well, we're all gaga for a bit of Garth. Garth, Garth. And Garth. a new documentary airing tonight on Virgin Media One is adding to the fever. What's happened to your Garth I accent? Don't know. You like, did your, your. I went with English there or something. You did. Can uh, you do your Garth let's accent? Let's move on. Let's take you a know what? Let's take a sneak peek, peek at tonight's documentary. <laughs> he was kind of just new to town and he was cleaning churches and selling boots. I thought he was a kid and I thought he looked like John Wayne. This is just a miracle to me that we sat in a room 
we, neither one of us had anything going on, and now we have a number one song. The most famed country music station in the world. There was magic in so much of that early Garth Brooks music. He had the audience in the palm of his hand. Until they slammed the door in his face. I don't think Garth realized the demand that was going to be. Suddenly, there was this shock for everybody. This is going to be over before you know it. It's going to be over too fast. What was meant to start this whole thing is now going to be where this whole thing ends. Virgin Media News reporter Paul Quinn joins us now. Hi, guys. I Hi. cannot believe you got to go to Nashville. I know. What a, what a gig. What a gig. Yeah, really <laughs> lucky. Like, we got to go back in April, Baton Rouge. We got to see him performing in Baton Rouge. He hadn't been there in 24 years. And obviously, calling Baton Rouge one of the biggest hits. Uh -huh. It was unbelievable. And then got to go to Nashville, yeah. So when you went in April to do this documentary, um, I love it, lads. We should definitely go to Nashville I for know. this documentary. Yeah. How do you, um, you were you were, you were still sure that the, co the gigs were going to go ahead in Crow Park then? Because I was oh, yeah. until he arrived, I was like, could, it, could they be cancelled? I know. I think there was a lot of fear, obviously, given what happened in 2014. Mm. And, Last September, when my boss, Mick McCaffrey, called me into the office and he said, look, we've heard a couple of rumblings that they're preparing for Garth Brooks to come back. Do you want to, you know, be on the story? I was like, hell yeah. I mean, I'm a, I'm a fan. Mm. I went to see him 25 years ago with my mum and dad back in Crow Park. So, look, we were fairly... We were had a good couple of sources and we ran with the story. And I think this time round, you know, the organisers, Acre Promotions, everyone, they had everything done right. Mm -hmm. So there was no chance that he... He wasn't going to be able to come because, like we, listen, we both went on Sunday. Loved it. Like what a, a Amazing. performance! You've yeah. been twice as yeah. well. What <laughs> is it? <laughs> what twice. is it about Ireland and and a certain group of Irish fans who just are gaga about Garth? I don't know what it is. Look, does it go back to the '90s when he came here in '94, '97, and? was so successful. And then like in 2014, where people were camping out mm. for days on end to get tickets. And then obviously that didn't happen. And she, you know yourselves, it was the biggest news story at the time. It was just mm. ridiculous where you'd end up Kenny getting involved with the Mexican ambassador trying to intervene. Yes. Like it was just bananas if when you think oh, back to it. pre-pandemic. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, that good was, old it was, it was so good. But the thing is, I suppose for Garth Brooks, there's a lot of I love Ireland, this is my last day. Yeah. Listen, we're we're a human ATM machine for him. Like, I mean, he's printing money here, essentially. Of, of course. But you got to go over and kind of talk to people who have been there throughout his career as mm. he's come up because he is this level of superstar in this country, a bit of Brazil and America. Like, that's, that's kind of yeah. it for Garth Brooks, which is a lot, of yeah. course. But... There, what what did you learn about him? Look, I think back in the in the late eighties, early nineties, he wasn't this superstar. And we met a couple of the songwriters that co-wrote some of the biggest hits: Pat Alger, Kent Blasey. Like they wrote "If Tomorrow Never Comes," which was his wow. first ever number one. Yeah. Unanswered prayers, uh, the thunder rolls, and they would have Pretty said like he was just a normal guy playing in these kind of dingy bars in Nashville, and then. Whatever happened, just the magic came together and they can't even explain it. We're like, you know, what's the success? And they're like, well, if we knew that, we'd bottle it and we'd be selling it on the streets. So it's really hard to pinpoint. But I think like, you know, if you in Crow Park, you heard when he'd start a couple of chords and all of a sudden the whole crowd was singing the river or the dance like back to him. It's the songs, it's the it's the lyrics of the songs, I think, that really like catch people's it, attention. Is it the same over in Baton Rouge and Louisiana? Because you went to a concert that like 105,000 people. Yeah, I know, Baton Rouge like was insane. Yeah. And they actually said there was an earthquake that night. Like, officially, there was seismic activity recorded. <laughs> because of the crowd. <laughs> yeah, that's what they're saying. <laughs> like, when he was playing Baton Rouge, they recorded seismic activity. Look, it's a great story. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why did facts get in the way of a good yarn? But it's official. They did record it. So it was it was insane, 104,000 people. But you know what? The crowds in Crow Park were even better. Honestly, it was like... Yeah. And uh, Rona McIntyre, who was our camera operator, in uh, Baton Rouge, we were saying to each other, we were like, where's all the cowboys? There were more people in Dublin with Stetsons on yeah. than there was in Baton Rouge. And you know what I I was watching it going, I need to get myself a Stetson. Yeah, so, I know, but, yes. but I kept on thinking about your man who bought the 40,000 Stetsons back in 2015. Oh, well, yeah. isn't he the one that's Remember. laughing now because they were all bought back out? Yeah, but that, do you know? I it, wonder if he still has, has them. Oh, oh yes, sure they've all been on sale around, um, around Marino and there's a couple of stores where they were bringing them all back. The amount of people with the, with the 2014 hats on them at the show was unbelievable. 
Oh, He's yes. the one laughing right now. He is absolutely fair play to him for doing that. I think of him often, that fella. So tonight, what we're going to get, Garth Brooks coming home, yeah. 9 p.m. He's This is where he's happiest, Mern. If he's he was happiest, happiest here, here he'd live here, Shorty. Yeah, do you not think? Exactly. And that's what he said in the clip. He said, and we're going to finish in Ireland. Yeah. And it's been... Like, he's cried how many times in the three I think at least nights. four on Sunday night, anyway, I counted. Do you not think that it's, it's going to be a bit like Elton John? He's going to keep on going and going and going. Well, he said this is the last of his big stadium tours. Right, OK. But, you know, could you see him coming back, maybe doing, like, a smaller, intimate gig inside or something like that? I think maybe that's what you could see. But he said this is the last of the really, really big shows. And it was really interesting... Um, we were on the plane from Baton Rouge to Nashville and we got on the plane and we didn't realise it wasn't assigned seating. So we were like the last to get on and our producer, Dave Tiernan, there was a seat and he said, oh, sure, I just hop in here. And there was a guy there with a Gar t-shirt and, you know, the typical Irish mm -hmm, thing. Yeah. I go, oh, were you at the show last night or whatever? And he's like, yeah, I was. He goes, he goes I was on stage. <laughs> and it's his guitar player, Gordon Kennedy, who's a Grammy award winning. <laughs> he's two Grammys. Um, he was... Did you take out the park. camera and be like, wow. you have a chat with us? No, he was like, come out to my house, come out to my studio, and he's in the documentary tonight. And he gives Amazing. great insight into what it's all about. Like, it's, it's just, it's incredible. Uh, listen, I'm not going to be going the next two nights, so I'm looking forward to seeing this. Garth yeah. Brooks, coming home. It's going to be on tonight, 9 o'clock on Virgin Media 1. Looking forward to Thank it, Paul. You so Thank much. you so much. Great to have you with us. Lovely to chat to you, Paul. Thank you so Thank much. You. We're back with you on Ireland AM very shortly. <laughs>
And the examiner leads with 200 euro cuts to monthly crest charges. Parents are likely to see their childcare costs decline by 200 euro per month next year and a further 200 euro per, per month the following year after an agreement that was reached between the government parties ahead of the next budget. And finally, the front page of The Sun, Dancing with the Stars is canned. The paper reports that RT bosses have told Dancing with the Stars producers that the show will end after the next season. Now, messages in here today, and we were talking about childcare costs, everything yeah. that's been kind of leaked ahead of the budget. 200 euro a month next year, this year, and 200 euro a uh, month the following It'll year. It'll be so 2,000... 800 euro over the next two years will be gone from childcare costs. Alan says, I'm sick and tired of hearing Double about that. childcare costs and today's reported 200 euro cut in the budget. I'm a pensioner. My wife is still working. We had to pay expensive childcare costs for our children. We did that by not going to the pub, not going to restaurants, not going on holidays and not having a second car. Our children were our responsibility and we weren't given any help by the government. There is no talk about a substantial increase in my contributory old age pension. A pension I paid over my working life. Pensioners got a five euro a uh, week increase in 2022. The first increase in three years, pensioners are being treated disgracefully by the government and it won't be forgotten in the next election. What do you make of that? 0896 there, you have one. It. there is one Contrast point. to that, Fiona well, has just said, one hope that I really hope the government follow through with this promise of cuts for childcare. I have three kids under the age of seven and as myself and my husband both work for, uh, full time, all three kids are in childcare. The costs are crippling us. I have to seriously consider giving up my work which is the last thing I want to do. I suppose one thing to point out is that this generation is the first generation in centuries that will be less well off than our parents. So like you know when it comes uh, to that we're at the standard of living uh, has kind of listen, decreased. We want people to go back to work and of course listen people are used to going to restaurants and used to going to pubs and going on holidays and, and, I don't and think to scale is. back from that, listen, there's no drama. That's but, like the, but, are, the, the headlines that say, you know, young people need to cut down on avocados so they can buy a house. It's not avocados <laughs> that are keeping me from buying a house, I can tell you that much. Um, we talk about recycling as well, about basically... Um, oh, sorry, we've been told to move on, aren't we? OK, right, we'll talk about recycling later on. Uh, coming up... Why have you ever moved on when you've been told to move on? Because I got a <laughs> shot up in my ear. <laughs> uh, footballer Stephanie Roach talks, pee my pressure and Vera Pow Pow chat here after the break. Our wonder goal back in 2013, what a goal it was. Uh, runner up a prize for our FIFA goal of the year, and she really she's put the game on the map in this country. We're joined this morning by footballer Stephanie Roach. Hello, Stephanie, how are you? Hi, Good, Stephanie. Guys. Thanks for having me. It's lovely to have you here, and I think, you know, every morning with the news recently, you know, with the sports news we've been watching here, and it's kind of watching the matches and the Irish team moving forward, and are we going to get that World Cup qualification? It's not as as straightforward as the men's game at all, is it, this qualification? No, it's it's ridiculous, really, how many games are involved. And it's funny, I've heard people making jokes about it, but I remember after the Finland game, I was doing the commentary on the game and everybody was like, oh, it's brilliant. You know, two games, usually with the men's, it's a two home and away leg playoff, but it's it's a little bit more complicated for the Women's World Cup. But look, we've missed the first round and we play the winners now of Austria and Scotland, which will be a difficult game and hopefully we'll get to the World Cup, but it's, it's a long process. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Who would you hope for? Um, I think probably Scotland. I haven't watched Austria in the in the recent Euros. So I thought they were quite good. I just think there might be a bit more of a familiarity. Like, but I think either game will be really, really tough. So as I said, it's still a long way to go. But please, God, they can get there. How do you find it? Because listen, the commentary side of it, but you're still playing, and yeah. like you got yeah. back into the squad in uh, a couple of months back in June. Yeah. Like, do you find it hard being on the punditry side or? You, you listen, you still want to be part of the squad more, so I'd say. Yeah, definitely. Obviously, you play at a high sport, a sport at a high level. It's, it's, you want to be competitive. You want to be in amongst the squad, particularly because I've been part of it for so many years, you know. But look, it hits a stage where you kind of, you have to take other opportunities to come your way. And obviously, I've been lucky enough to do the punditry on the games, and I love being part of that as well. But definitely, a piece of me is definitely with the squad, and you always want to be part of it and, and be in, mm. within amongst it. And obviously, when you see the celebrations and stuff within me, I'm celebrating with them as well because I've been part of the squad for so many years. But it is difficult not to kind of, to be really part of it as such. Sorry. But that's the thing, because you are, as you mentioned, you're still involved and you're still waiting, I would assume, for Vera <laughs> to pick up the phone. 
you know, look, we've had conversations, obviously, over the last couple of years, really, I suppose, the last three years or so. I've been kind of on standby and stuff within the squad. I've been doing the home base sessions, been sending my minutes in and stuff like that. So I've always been part of it and been on the outside. I got my opportunity, as you mentioned, to come back into the squad in June. And I played against the Philippines, which was great because I hadn't been, hadn't started for Ireland in quite a while. So yeah. that was a lovely moment. But obviously, when you get back in, the aim is to try and stay in. Unfortunately, I wasn't kept in. So it's it's difficult. Do you find, because I know when you first started commentating, you weren't that long a, after your professional career, yeah, yeah. you were still in it. So is it hard to kind of criticise people that you know? It can be. And to be fair, like, I don't think I've ever been harsh. I'd never, like, single out anybody and say, oh, that was brutal or anything. You know, I'd never kind of make a, a bad comment because I know all the girls personally and I know none of them would purposely make a mistake either, you know, so you kind of have to have that. But at the same time, I think myself and Karen particularly would, would be quite close to the girls. And but it's important that we're not patronising them either. You yeah. know, you have to be, you have to say what you see because people who are watching the game would have maybe watched a lot of the men's games and hear the criticism within that. So if there's mistakes being made or things aren't going well, you have to kind of speak about it as well. So so that can be, it can be tough. The but. thing I find about it is no matter how harsh or how honest you are, it's never going to be as harsh and as honest as, say, Vera Pau is going to be because the coach mm -hmm. is like in the team environment. Yeah. You know, there's some real harsh truths in there. So I kind of feel it's an easy way. Like, <laughs> he says this in his head. He's like, I'm not being as bad as the coach. Maybe that's why the lads don't talk to me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but as Merlin said, we're seeing it more on the news. We're seeing it all the time. And the fact that the, the teams are going so well. Do you think that you know women's sport is just becoming more and more on the map? And certainly even with the Euros, it was amazing to see the, the viewing, viewing figures for it. Yeah, look, it's brilliant. And I think that's really helped as well, the, the Euros being on. It was obviously a pity Ireland weren't there. But I think the fact that the games are on telly more, I think if you look at billboards around the city, you see all the girls' faces. There's a recognisability or recognise a familiarity to the team. You know, that way I think people know oh, that's Katie McCabe, that's mm -hmm. Nisa Sullivan, which is nice to have. I think it's important for young people, boys and girls, because I do a lot of coaching within schools, and I have young boys coming up to me now talking about the women's team, which is lovely to see. And I think it's because it's more in the media, there's more talk about it, there's more coverage of the games. And as I said, these girls within the squad now are becoming role models, and it's, it's great for, for young boys and girls to have that. Yeah, because sport is sport. Once it's on the telly, if you're a sports fan, you're watching the sport. Exactly. Like, you know, and we've seen that the standard is just incredible, especially, I think, like when... <laughs> especially with GA, with Gaelic football, like the women's game has just kind of, it's gone so yeah. massive and we can see it. And I think it was the Euros that have set it apart now at this yeah, stage. Yeah, definitely. And look, it's brilliant to see and hopefully long way it continue because I think women's football has come a long, long way, but there's still a little while to go. So I think if the girls were to get to the World Cup, that would definitely be the thing that would really set it alight in terms of the spotlight. And you can see the interest in the team having got to the playoff and yeah. how great would it be to get to a World Cup. And, and the numbers that are getting involved in it as well and sponsors hugely helps. Yeah, definitely. You need that. Definitely. Yeah. As I said, the billboards around the city sky have done a great job with that in terms of promoting the team, promoting the individuals within the team. Because I think before, when you watch the Ireland men's team, you would always have players who you'd be able to relate to. Whereas now, so many young people can see these young players and, and, and the girls within the team kind of, as I said, are more well known. And I think the first thing that I realised, when, when I think about college, I think sport straight away. Don't you, in the first few weeks? Yeah. No, absolutely not. It's all about rugby week and everyone. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. mad. But you're Enjoying gonna try, you're gonna be trying you're gonna run to colleges. I am indeed, yeah. I'm actually... the, do they people have to try to score goals as you're trying to score goals as well? What's this happening? Is it. So we, I'm actually work, working with just the at the moment we have a hits the spot challenge. We're going around and we're in DCU today all day, so we're doing nice. challenge myself. And Darren Conway actually are going to be there all day. So we'll be uh, setting up challenges to be spot prizes to be won. Um, Champions League, obviously Justy are Champions League sponsors now. So they're going to be giving out tickets to Champions League matches and lots of spot prizes. So a bit of fun. So hopefully a few people will come but, and join but us. But you're Stephanie Roach. <laughs> and, and these are college students who have to try to take goals as can't you've taken. Straight. <laughs> <laughs> you can't see straight. Like as in, you know, we all know that you've got one of the best goals that we've ever seen from the country ever. So, you know, no pressure on these students around you're here putting the pressure country. on me there now, Maureen. I mean, it's, it's your job. We can do that. You know what I mean? Like, it must be brought up all the time about the goal. Is it? Are you sick of it? Or is it still like, oh, come on, it was amazing? Um, it's, it's a funny one because obviously it was a huge part of my career and it kind of helped, as you mentioned before, me kind of help women's football and put kind of a bit more emphasis on the Women's National League here in Ireland. Yeah. But obviously... I think some people out there think it's the only goal I ever scored, which can be difficult to take as well, you know? Like, obviously, it's it's the goal that people know and people recognise me for. But 
again, it can be a bit, as people always say, oh, Ronnie Calder got that goal. Whereas now, actually, in fairness, people actually know my name, which is nice. But, um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, 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 as I said, it was a huge part of my career. Yeah. But there are times where you're kind of like, yeah, I did score. Well, what are goals? They also <laughs> knew you because, uh, you, of course, back in June, you and your long-term partner, Dean, got married as well. I mean, I was just really, I didn't realise this. Of course, you were away with the Ireland squad yeah. up until like a couple of days before the wedding. How? <laughs> it was a bit of a skelter, all right, yeah. Like, like, don't hit me in the ball with the face. <laughs> in, in, in the face, face of the ball. ball. Way around, yeah. yeah, look, it was, it was mad as well because I actually, I was on standby for the squad again and we had a training session uh, on the Tuesday and the squad were travelling the Wednesday and literally that evening I was asked if I'd like to travel with the team because Fira obviously knew I was getting married and we didn't actually get back into the country until two days before my wedding so it was kind of like are you available to come and obviously I was like straight away yeah no problem I'm coming dumped everything on Dean although I've done everything up until that point so he deserves uh, sure, a little bit sure. to do there <laughs> you go you had to just take control of this and the thing is if that's you... the important bit on the lead in yeah it Imagine was... you make a mistake then. Uh oh, no, I forgot to organise that. Sorry, yeah, I forgot yeah. to organise the lift. She'd already organised everything. It was <laughs> fine. I didn't even know you had it on the screen. Wow. We've got it on there. <laughs> You've been together since you were 18. Yeah, we were together quite a long time. And um, I was saying to you off air, obviously, Dean told me when he gave me the engagement ring that he ran out of present ideas. So <laughs> it was about time. But uh, <laughs> uh, look, we've both. Um, put football first our whole lives, you yeah. know, and I've obviously been away. I've, I've been in different countries around the world over the last couple of years. And when I came back, actually, it was just around the start of the virus outbreak in, in Italy. I came back about two years ago, and since yeah. then it was kind of, it was always going to happen, but we just kind of had to wait for the right. moment, so. Did you get away? Did you even get to have a honeymoon or anything? No, not yet. We're obviously both still in season, so um, we finish in November, around November, so. And um, we're hoping to get away for, for a couple of days anyway. <laughs> for a couple of days? Well, we'll get maybe two weeks or so because boat working as well, you know yourself. <laughs> you know yourself. You gotta, do, you gotta do your bits and pieces. This is it. But hopefully we're gonna be talking to you when, you know, all of this does come to fruition for Ireland. It's very much going to be squeaky bum time for the next little while for them. Yeah, definitely. As I said, it's, it's still a long way to go, but they've done fantastic to get as far as they have. So hopefully the country continues to get behind the team and and, you know, the dream maybe might happen if we get to the World Cup. It'd be great to see. Can you imagine? Are you ready to, to sing a song and put them under pressure? Uh, <laughs> not, not just yet. We'll wait till we get there first. All right, okay. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm already I'm thinking about the great tune. Imagine the excitement. It'd be unbelievable. I know. We, we, live, we're, we live here. I don't live here, by the way, but we, we're, close to, <laughs> we're close to walking sound. And every time you go past that roundabout, it does make me think about Italia 90 yeah, all the time. Yeah, like, just yeah. the scenes and the glory. And it would be amazing. It'd be way. brilliant to have that buzz around the team, as oh, I said. It would be so good. Stephanie Roach, it has been a pleasure chatting That's to right, you. Have guys. fun in UCD today. Thank you very much. DCU. DCU. <laughs> DCU. That's good luck it. to the students trying to take you on, all right. It was a great pleasure. Thanks, Thanks very so much, much. Stephanie. Cheers. Thank you. Welcome back. Edward Hayden is feeding us today. He sure is. A Cajun chicken noodle salad is on the menu. Good morning to you, Good morning Edward. to you both. Yeah, this is gorgeous. And I suppose, I think as September comes and the kind of the leaves start uh, falling from the trees, we do start kind of focusing a little bit maybe on healthy and all of that. And we try to kind of settle back in, not so much healthy, but we try to settle back into a dietary routine and a routine in general. That's my line anyway, Mirren. It's your, your line and you you're sound still convinced. convinced. <laughs> I'm just sitting there going, it gets very comfort food. Foodie, yeah, of course it? it does. Of course it does. But this is nice. And I suppose, again, I suppose it's timely because we're hearing so much about the inflated cost of food and dining out. So this is an option maybe for people to bring to work during the week for a couple of days. So it's very, very simple. What it is, it's a lovely marinated uh, chicken. So I'm just going to pop on my little glove here just to marinate the chicken. Now, again, of course, marinades are really good and we're so familiar with them from uh, the summertime when we're all doing our barbecue. Yeah. This is a very, very simple marinade. So I very simply have just got some Cajun spice. Now, I just think that's kind of nice. It's almost like that North American or those Creole flavours, mm. which are always really good. Perfect I've got some of the uh, spoonable kefir from Irish yogurt in Clonakilty. So and kefir yogurt, because that's, it's like real healthy that, isn't it's it? It's very big much, fan at home with yeah, it's very much in rage. vogue at the minute. And of course, all of this kind of fermented food is really like popular and in vogue at the minute. 
Absolutely. So but it's for also, the gut. It's good for the it's gut, It's very right? good for gut health and it's very good, obviously, for kind of the circular movement of the gut and all of that sort of thing and, okay. the, and the health uh -huh. of it. Um, also, so it's polite. really good. He's so polite. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> very polite. <laughs> good for the inside. Which is Let's a good country around. upbringing, yeah. <laughs> now, uh, again, a uh, nice high source in protein as well. So it gives you that sense of energy. Um, I always have like a bit of fruit and yogurt in the morning and then run for the day. I'm one of these people who kind of skips the bit in the middle. Okay. But again, it gives you that nice bit of energy. And do you still get the goodness in it now when you cook it? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do with this, my use of it is two-pronged, so I'm going to kind of cook it in terms of the chicken and then I'm going to use it as a dressing. So I'm using it as oh, like a mayonnaise alternative, mm. so it works quite nice. Now, just look at that lovely colour that we get uh, with that. Then what I've got is I've got some chicken. Now, what I've done is I've just cut the chicken into long, thin strips, but you could cube it if you want. This also works really nice if you want to do it with, like, strips of pork. Uh, it works really breasts, nicely. I'm using the chicken uh, breast. Thighs. Yeah, I'm using chicken breast, but you could very happily use thighs as well if you want. I'm just going to give that a nice good old mix around just like so. Make sure that it's all coated. Now whilst I'm using the strips just when you're on that Tommy you could of course use the whole thigh or the whole breast uh -huh. and kind of roast that whole if you so desired. What I'm going to do with that once that's nicely marinated we'll just pop that into the fridge. We're going to leave that for about an hour or two in the fridge and then we'll come back to that. There's Pop a fridge that. there, Moran. Well yeah, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get to do the cookery segments too often. Absolutely. I have no idea. There's a I fridge. can put my water I mean, in there. I don't what do they say? We're in all mod cons. <laughs> <laughs> all mod cons. <laughs> I mean, it's not going to stay in the fridge there for very long. <laughs> yeah. you know, you know, anyway. Now, in there, into the fridge, that's going to go about an hour or two, leave it to marinate, leave those flavours to kind of really macerate into the chicken. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop it onto a baking tray, pop it into the oven for about 15, 20 minutes, 180, 350, gas mark okay. four. We have an and oven as well, are you kidding? Ah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, Who would have I'm thought? Joking, I'm Even joking. the bit of washing up liquid. <laughs> then the resultant mixture is this lovely chicken here, which is absolutely gorgeous. Now, that being said, here what I've got is I've got some lovely cooked noodles. So I've just blanched and refreshed those noodles and I'm going to put some bits and pieces into it. Now, this is the kind of the, the bottom um, shelf of the fridge job. So I've just got some lovely peppers which I have roasted. I love uh, oh, peppers. Roast them. <gasps> So How long did you stick them with the roast peppers in first? Now, right, come here till I tell you the secret. I'm going to tell yeah. you and everyone else Good. at home. You put the peppers onto the tray, you put your oil, you put your salt and pepper, you put them into the oven. When they're between half and three quarters cooked, pull them out. Don't wait them to be fully oh, cooked because okay. as they cool down, they continue to cook in the residual heat. Yeah, yeah. Cucumber, I'm going in there with some cucumber as well. I've just got some diced cucumber. I've got a little bit of diced scallion or spring onion in there as well. I'm going to roll my lime, give my lime a little roll. I'm going to cut that. And then I'm also going to put some cherry tomatoes uh, in there as well. And then I'm going to make the dressing. Now, what I'm going to do, as you can see, is I'm actually going to make the dressing in the bowl. So I'm going to dress the salad in the bowl. Okay. And that'll just be really nice to get a full coating. So I'm just going to take some of these cherry tomatoes and I'm just going to cut those into halves. Okay, just like so. Lovely. Uh, pop all of those in, so what and do you mean then now you're making the dressing in the bowl. I'm going to oh, sorry, I'm not making dressing in the bowl. Well, I am, I suppose, making the dressing in the bowl, but I'm going to dress the salad and mix it all at the one time. So I don't need to make this dressing separately. I could just put in the kind of the composite ingredients. There's only two or three composite ingredients. The one, the lime is one. Uh, the next one then is some uh, more of our lovely um, spoonable kefir. It's uh, that natural product. So I'm going to put in some of that, and just to remind you, it's a nice little mayonnaise-based alternative. In difference in taste now. With the kefir and you get natural that kind yogurt. of um, what would I call it like that acidic or that cultured flavour. There's yeah. just like a sharper bite okay. to it, which is which is really nice. Um, but again, really nice in flavour. Please, God, let this open. Go on, Tommy, you can over here. Oh, with the gloves. Big strong man. Give a little flex ah, there, Tommy. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Still got it. I am man. <laughs> Still got now, it. Little girl you. can pass it over there. You can pass it over. Ooh, it's a jar. Yeah. Of show. Do you know what he won't do? He won't wash it out for the recycling, though, no, will he? No. Now, yeah, in there, we're going that. to go with some of our lovely chili jam. I'm going to blame the gloves as my barrier. Okay. Uh, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to just mix all of that around, just loosely and lightly, and then I'm going to pile it in to my bowl. So you can just see. I'm just tossing it. What I'm going to do is just going to get a little small bit of that in Put there that first. Put straight onto the plate okay, there is I what I reckon. I certainly am. Yeah, absolutely. Give yeah. <laughs> me one little secondo. So pop that in, give it a nice little mix around. And then, as I said, what I've got is I've got some of my lovely That's chicken delicious. here. I've got the lovely strips of chicken, which we have cooked. I'm going to pop those on the top. 
just like so. Or you could mix them into the salad. And then just to embellish it off, I've got some lovely uh, sesame seeds oh, there. Oh, yeah. And I've brought with me a little small bit tin of coriander, which I'm just going to tear mm. across the top. And that's just your really nice, really gorgeous salad. That's all salad. for me. There's your, absolutely. There there is your, there's your biblical sense, that lovely salad there uh, as well. Pass them down the, the bits there. And it just works really nicely. As I said, if you're having an occasion at home, people are having little parties or having friends around, put it into your nice dish and serve it up. And uh, it's really nice. So hopefully people will enjoy cooking that at yeah, home. The kefir is fine, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It's There's really no nice. real difference between it and the normal yoghurt. Again, it just gives you the creamy sense, but by adding the other flavour to it, like the chilli or whatever, it just acts as that really kind of nice savoury dressing. That's actually delicious. You're very welcome. Mm. That Lovely. is so good. Edward Hayden, Knocked to the Park. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank Enjoy. You. And at you, Texas, when we weren't. From oodles of noodles to the food <laughs> of love, Derek goes oyster farming next. <laughs> You're very welcome back to the show. Now the world is Derek Hartigan's oyster and today our wandering weatherman is learning about oyster farming. Over to you, Dee. Yeah, the wandering weatherman, I love it. <laughs> anyway, the sun is out, the tide is out. We could not have picked a better morning to go oyster harvesting here in Carnival County Loud. The man behind it all is Kian Kian. What a setup you've got going on here. Hey, Derek, thanks for coming down and seeing us today. Yeah, you picked a lovely day. If you are here yesterday, it was lashing rain. So, <laughs> But you're a weatherman, so you know which days to come down here. Though. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, tell us what you've got here in the lock. So, it's an oyster farm. And so some people think yeah, it's a wild fish where you just fish for the oysters. But we actually farm the oysters. And when we buy them, they're about the size of your little fingernail. And it takes them three years to get to about this size. So, there's three years of growing. And if you look at these lines, this is about 30 kilometres of, of bags on our farm. And uh, it we grade the whole farm once a year and so they're graded three times over the three year growth. Now in terms of feeding, what do they eat? So what happens, you can see the bags that they grow in, there's holes in them and the, the seawater washes through the bag and carries plankton and the oysters graze on the plankton the same way as the sheep are grazing on grass in the mountains. So, okay. so they're just, as you can see, like maybe three quarters of the shore is empty and that's because if we put more trests on the beach than this, there's not enough food for them. So the, that number of bags is kind of in balance with the amount of food. But we the see water. the lads, some of the team coming out. You have to flick the bag yes. to turn them over yeah, yeah, every day. Yeah. Why do you do that? Yeah, so if you look at the bags, I'll just turn this one here over. You can see seaweed growing on the bag. Okay. And that clogs up all the holes in the in the mesh so the seawater can't wash in. So the guys are flicking it over and because it's dark, the seaweed dies and it'll grow on this side and it's just, we have to repeat that every four to six weeks. Now you're up and running a long, long time. Of course, Dad, well, Dad is 83 now. He's, yeah, yeah. He, he, he retired and then got back into it because yeah. he got bored. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, he started the farm in the 70s and uh, he came to Ireland with me mom in a wooden boat. They sailed here and he was always into the sea and he heard about farming oysters on and the radio. And we have some beautiful drone shots there and there at the moment. I mean, it's a big setup, really, isn't it? Um, it's, there's some bigger, there's, a, there's quite a few bigger oyster farms in Ireland that we have here, but it's kind of a nice size. We have a nice group of people and it kind of runs on its own, which is And you were perfect. telling me back in the 70s and the 80s, of course, there was many oyster farms here along the Carlingford coastline. Um, probably a bit older than that. There was a lot of uh, wild oyster fisheries and they were all fished out about 100 years ago. And then this oyster is the Pacific oyster and it, farm, it, it, it responds really well to being farmed. And it's only got a three year growing cycle. So it was introduced into Ireland to kind of uh, reinvigorate the oyster industry. And it, if you look in any oyster bay in Ireland, any, any bay in Ireland, you'll probably find an oyster farm somewhere. Now, in terms of import export, where are we at? Um, like, oysters used to be all exported out of Ireland, but you, you definitely see a lot of interest in Ireland. Now, the, like, the Irish market is building up, but it's maybe only about 10% of Where are you grow. exporting to? Mostly to the UK. Okay. And we've some lovely customers in the UK, and they really like our oysters, and we love sending them there. Okay, So we hope yeah. to continue doing <laughs> we that. We hope to continue. If anybody's listening. Now, <laughs> let's take a look at the goodies here. Okay, so here we go. So, of course, so the, you're, you're part of the seafood trail here in County Louth as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, so we'll be, taking, we'll be taking people out to do tours of the oyster farm eventually, which would be great crack. Okay. Um, so, here we've got some oysters. That these are just in a bag grown here. There's about 100 oysters in a bag. There are 100 grams. It's about 10 kilos, which is perfect. Okay. If you look at the seed over here, there was about 500 oysters in a bag, and they're much smaller. So what we're doing is putting them in at that density, and after a year, grading them, and then splitting them down. Yeah, now, if they're open like this, what oh, does that Oh, yeah, mean? that's really important. So if the oyster's alive, it's closed really tightly. Yes. If they die, they spring open. Okay. So the oyster's keeping itself closed. If you have an open oyster, 
don't eat it. It's really okay, important. Okay, so if you get them into restaurants, and if you're storing them in the fridge, then what way do you store oh, them? Oh, yeah, so if you leave the oyster like this, there's a little bit of water inside, and it kind of seeps out because the water, the shell is not waterproof. So if you keep them like like this, they'll stay, they'll keep for two or three days. Yes. And like this, two or three weeks. So okay, that makes so a turn huge difference. Okay, yeah. so it keeps the liquid in. Okay, let's open up the goodies. Let's see right. what's inside. Okay, so you've got your deep shell and the flat shell, and at the front of the deep shell is like a little nose and okay. just under the nose there's a wee space where you can place the a knife. Wee, a wee space so in on it you have to be very careful with yes, this. Yes but you don't need a lot of pressure if you're doing it right. Okay how many harvesting across uh, the year as well? Um, we do about two and a half million oysters every, wow. Open every up year. There. <laughs> We're all waiting to see the oyster inside. Right so you just pop the hinge like that. Yeah. I'll just clean the knife sometimes okay. there's a bit of grit. Here we go. Are we going to eat this live on air? Yeah, you? yeah, you can okay. eat the oysters straight from the sea here in Carlingford. That's amazing, isn't it? Um, okay, here we go. I've never eaten an oyster, by the way. Brilliant. So this is your first <laughs> oyster on, on air. On National so TV. So you can see, see, because it's really fresh, there's yes. quite a bit of water inside. I'm going to pour a little bit of water away. A little away bit of water, okay. Because it'll, it'll overpower the taste of the oyster a little bit. Okay. But what you can do is, I'll make sure there's no shell in there for you. Um, cut it from the bottom shell That looks also. really, really nice. Okay, well here done. we go. Are so we ready to there's go? a wee bit of water. Sip the water first. And they said it's uh, and then an aphrodisiac, is it? It's an aphrodisiac as well, but you yeah. need to eat about a dozen for them to work oh, right. properly. <laughs> okay, here we go. So, mm. oh, 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 now it's quite slimy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it goes down pretty easy, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Very nice. Yeah. So there's a lot of, uh, about a dozen of these. About a dozen of these, yeah. And the aphrodisiac effects kick yeah, in. Yeah, we guarantee our oysters. If you buy a dozen, <laughs> they don't work, we give you your money back. Yeah. <laughs> So there you go. We're on Tommy. Will I send you back two or three bags, guys? I was just about to say, he's You're just going to chew it. Chew it, Derek. He's just going to go around there now. He, he'll have 78 done. He'll have 78 done by the sauce. next one. Yeah, lovely. Tabasco, beautiful and sexy that. Now, from oysters to the big O, holistic, holistic sex educator Jenny Keane will be here on spicing things up in the bedroom. We've it's got a, a theme. It's all a myth. Oh, gosh. Lucy's such a lovely woman. Welcome back to Ireland AM. Coming up in the final hour, what is it, Tommy? Broadcaster Maya Dunphy is going to be here very shortly. Meg Ryan famously showed how easy they are to fake. We're going to be learning, they're very real. We learn about the female orgasm. On that note. <laughs> I think it's time for a bit of fashion, yes. Uh, you know me, I love my fashion, and I'm all about the black leggings, and Lorna Duffy yes. is here to talk us through them. Lorna, Not what we've got? Not the black leggings this morning now, Tommy, but you know what? I'm going to no. show you how you can style them this autumn. We have lots of really nice pieces. So everyone loves black leggings, but it's kind of tricky to style them sometimes. So we're tying in some really nice autumn trends, taking some inspo from a few of my favourite A-listers as well. Um, and, yeah. Kind of like uh, jeans, so they've got a, like a pocket look, at the back and stuff. This is I like them. So they look like jeans. They're actually leggings, but because they look like jeans, you can go for that really dressy, so smart casual look. So you could go on a date in this outfit. Jeggings. And j or we could go jeggings. Yes, Tommy, that hey, works as well. Do you know I do You know, time? I don't even need to be here. You can just do fashion today. Do you know what? You're yeah. probably right. <laughs> uh, okay, let's go find out what the weather is today. Derek, how are you getting on? How are you feeling after that oyster? Well, I'll tell you, Tommy. Look, we're standing here in the middle of Carlingford Lock. The sun is shining. I am. Mm. on oyster number six so we're halfway through until the aphrodisiac effects kick in but come here lads this would suit your item perfectly later on <laughs> what do you think <laughs> Derek is just incredible isn't he He's Fair play, he is iconic do you know what else is iconic can you remember this moment from 2010 I think this has been like the thing of reading all in day the long. years yeah so can we have a take a look at this everyone remembers this of course, it is. We're not saying that the weather is turning icy, though, are no, no. we? Infamously, oh. man slips on ice. It's Every media outlet in Ireland has been searching for that man for 12 years and he still refuses to talk. So are it's you, iconic. Are you saying that Virgin Media News might have found a replacement? I think we have. Yesterday, we had one such moment. Nicole Gernon was at Dublin Airport having a chat about all the queues. And look at this, lads. Oh, no. are we buying it? No. Are we buying it? Do you know what? He shouldn't even be given airtime for that. It was such, <laughs> like, if you're talking dancing on, I, uh, uh, dancing with the stars is going to be gone. This fella would have got a, a one out of ten for that. <laughs> so, mean, no, you think that the dive is just too... Look at him, he knows exactly what he's doing. 
Who knows who he is? We haven't found him yet, have we? Have, have they, have they uh, named him on Twitter? Um, so we were looking at that yesterday. It's a dive. It's a complete dive. You wouldn't yeah, see it absolutely. on Ronaldo, would you? Uh, Ronaldo would be rolling around holding his shin after that one. I wonder if Nicole Garner went and actually checked if he's all right. I don't know if Nicole we noticed, actually. Nicole we went on. to check and see if Nicole uh, had noticed that. Yeah, listen, it's not quite Iceman 2, is it? It's not, unfortunately. We're still waiting for that golden moment of another person who slips on the ice. Listen, let's get back to childcare costs yeah. because we have a lot of messages to go through and this is a pretty long one from Noel. So there's uh, the government are hoping to give 200 euro per month to families who've got kids in childcare with another 200 euro from next year as well. Noel has said there are no easy, easy answers to the challenges facing families with childcare costs. But one thing is clear, the current level of stress that comes with both parents working has a huge cost to well-being. Maybe it's time to concede that we cannot have it all. Surely our goal should be a pursuit of peace and mind over materialism. So if that second income is mopped up to pay for childcare, if that second car is to facilitate that second job, if the gym membership and other subscriptions, as well as the trips to Disneyland and foreign holidays are crippling you, then maybe it's time to re-examine your life and ask what is really important. Uh, Not putting the kids into the crash. The savings of all of the above would mean more to compensate for the surrendering of that second job by one parent. And can you imagine the peace of mind? Yeah, I think the probably the issue is here is that you always see that regardless of who makes most <laughs> money, it's the woman who does give up the job in that situation. Suzanne says, I'm a mother of three. I worked at a loss to ensure I didn't lose out in my career, which was my choice. Could parents please stop Moaning is what Suzanne says. We chose and are lucky to have our children. Who else do we expect should be paying for the associated costs but us? She thinks you have it's the kids, you've got to pay for them. Yes, but it's the extortionate <laughs> costs. Childcare is extortionately expensive. Like, it's I agree. beyond a mortgage. Like, it's ridiculous money. So, I mean, if you're but getting a bit of help people... so that people can go back to work, I think is absolutely deserved. I mean, whether they're going to give you compensation for money or there should be a tax break against it because you want more people in the workforce than people feeling that. But there's some people home. choosing not to have children because they can't afford them. Maybe, yeah. Like, I assume some people are. Anyway, this is something that I'm sure we are going to be talking about again and again and again. Two weeks until budget. I would imagine so. Mm. But we've got something different now. Break time next because broadcaster Maya Dumphy is going to join us for a chat and she might talk to us about crash fees. No, she doesn't have to do that. No, no, we're done. Welcome back to the show. Our next guest is comfortable in front and behind the cameras. It's Maya Dunphy. Good morning. How are you doing? I am much more comfortable behind the cameras, I think, especially <laughs> this hour of the morning. <laughs> That's not yeah. great. Thanks well, for well, having me. Well, you look amazing. Far. Even though, can we smell a bit of puke? Oh, Jesus, <laughs> don't. Don't. <laughs> Oh, what happened awful. this no, morning? Uh, my little boy, who's seven, and he's never been sick in his life, uh, threw up this morning before I had to leave the house. So I had, I spent the 20 minutes I was meant to be getting ready, wiping up a trail of vomit. I'm the world's worst parent. Be Having bigger. kids, it's, it, it's chaos, isn't it? Oh, says you from the comfort of the couch. <laughs> wife to do all the work at home. I need a wife, that's what I need. I actually miss the morning, it's the best thing ever. Honestly, not being there in the morning. Oh, not being there. Oh. I'm telling it's you, so the handy. guilt, the guilt, the guilt. Hold on, but he's, he's never, sorry to talk about it, but you're, he's seven years old and he's never puked. No. That's kind of a myth. Like, how do We're you do that? We're not puking people. Here we you know go. what I'm saying? We're not bad, you is... No, it's not a bad, you know, some people are vomiters. I have friends who get sick all the time and we're just not really pukey people. He's not a pukey child. <laughs> We've iron stomachs. We've iron stomachs. But so are you feeling happens, guilty today now? I am racked with guilt. And I used the wash off tans. So there's a little bit of vomit there that I couldn't wipe off. <laughs> Is that too much information? No, it's not. Anyway, That's what you want this morning. Let's move on. Good morning. Good morning. It's <laughs> lovely to have you here. Um, of course, like when you talk about Tom, he's, you know, you're so close with him. Yeah. But that does bring up your mom your gorgeous mom who passed away in February this yeah. year because she was such a huge support. Yeah. Like, you're a single mom. She was such a huge... Your whole family are. How are you doing? Yeah, well, the thing is, I mean, grief, as you know, grief is universal. Mm. But at the same time, grief is also incredibly personal and everyone deals with it differently. And funny enough, yesterday was my mum's birthday um, and it was one of the next, the first you have to get through. But actually yesterday was fine because I was braced for it. But this morning when Tom was sick, the first thing I would usually do in that case was ring my mum because she was always up early and she would have said, I'll get in the car, I'll come in, 
don't send him to school, you do what you have to do. So I actually got more upset this morning over that than I did for her birthday yesterday, which yeah. is, oh, these things catch you off guard and they blindside you and... It was it, yeah, wrong it those small yeah. things that you just... Yeah. Like, it wasn't a small amount of nothing. vomit, it was quite a lot of <laughs> <laughs> It's the sort of thing she definitely would have cleaned that up for me as well. <laughs> she would have said, just go, just go and I'll be there. And it would be like, what's the character from Reservoir Dogs, Mr Wolf, who comes and... Yes, oh, yeah. Mr. Yeah, Mr. Yeah, Mr Wolf. That was crime yeah. scenes, but you know, it's you get you get the idea. That's, <laughs> That's what bananas do, like. they can do crime like scenes, they can do vomit. So yeah, it's those little things that catch you off guard and like I said, knock you for six. Um, but the big day is like Mother's Day this year. We'd only just lost her. And my mm. phone was ablaze of people saying, how are you today? I was like, actually, I'm fine. Yeah. My mum thought it was a lot of nonsense anyway. So it's the little things that catch you off guard. Yeah. yeah. So you said there a lot of people messed you. Like, is that very important when you're going through a period like this? People checking in, just, just like a simple message. Yeah, I think it is. And it's... Um, you know, I think there's, there's, a, there's, an, there's an attitude to grief that a lot of people think, I will leave you alone, I haven't heard from you, I'll wait to hear from you, I yeah. didn't want to disturb, I didn't want to intrude. And I'm sure you got that when you lost your dad, Mirren, as well. And actually, you know, I did a tweet about it and it actually went almost viral where people said, I said, don't leave the grieving alone, don't leave the bereaved alone, just check in, just send a text, mm. just ask them how they are. If they don't reply, they don't reply, but it's, yeah. it's, it's nice to check in. And that's actually what the campaign I'm involved with now is about, but not, about, not around bereavement, but the Mind Your Mates campaign that I'm launching today um, is a kind of national drive to get people to check in with their friends um, over the next few months. It's going to be a very tough winter. Mm. And I think COVID shut down so much of our social lives. Now, we know that, the, the big things and the restaurants and the events, but actually the smaller things, like meeting friends for coffee or a walk, um, some of those things didn't come back. Some people mm. didn't put those things back in place. And I think we're going into... I mean, the news is awful now. It's relentlessly oh, yeah. awful. Yeah. And we have to find little pockets of happiness. So this campaign with Zenfloor, Mind Your Mates, is about just take a minute over the winter to check in with people, check in with your friends. Because it is so, it's funny the perspective that people can have. I was talking to a friend of mine whose husband was away for three weeks and she was like a single mother for those three weeks, but she only had to do it for three weeks. Oh, my heart bleeds for her. And, do you know what I mean? But she was sitting there going, oh, because some of her mates, you know, are single mothers and they're like, she's like, I don't know how they do it. Mm. Yeah. Because the wor she was like, my world became very small mm. because she didn't, she didn't, she didn't have time for friends, she didn't have time for anything. She was yeah. like, if, if they got a fish finger, they were lucky. God, you're really rubbing this in. Do you know? But it's <laughs> uplifting <laughs> morning. Oh, but, no, but, but one thing is, but I, it's, life but it's is all also, perspective. Yeah, life it? is relative to you. And I don't look at my friends who have very supportive partner and go, isn't it well for you? I don't do that. Yeah. This is just my life. And I'm very, very lucky. You know, my son is lovely and he's healthy. He's fabulous. I have a supportive family. I have lovely friends and this is just my reality and it's fine, you know? And um, yeah, obviously you've got your own podcast as well with Paddy Courtney yes. as well. I mean, is that something that, you know, the two of you seem to bond over that as well has been really important in the last couple of months? It has actually. And I said to Paddy recently, it's, it was a lifeline to me that I didn't expect because we started doing it at the beginning of the year and then my mum got very sick and then she passed away and I cancelled all my work. But with Paddy, I know him so well, we're friends for 20 years. Mm. I was still, I only missed one week and I was, he said, look, take as much time as you need. I said, actually, to have to leave the house every Thursday when we record and go in and chat with a friend and have a bit of levity and have some mm -hmm. fun was really good for me. It was a bit of a lifeline. No pressure, Paddy. That, I was just about to say, that's <laughs> really that's the room where people can get it wherever they yes. get their podcast. But yeah. also, you are a fan. Now, this is where we would disagree. You're a fan of voice notes. Which is basically sometimes they are just I'm podcasts. I'm a huge fan. It depends. I find them so easy even in the car as opposed to texting. Yeah. Uh, now, no. how long can your voice notes go on for? Okay, well, I try and keep mine brief ish, but I have a friend, Louise, who shan't remain nameless now, and Louise is notorious. She sent me a 12 minute one once. That's 12 minutes. Yeah. But you know what? You can play it on. Double speed. Yes, and I have you can. it playing when I get my breakfast ready. But I think, and again, as part of this campaign, one of the things I suggested was not everyone feels able to pick the phone up sometimes. So voice notes. Look at your cynical grin. Yeah, voice. No, notes. it's not. I'm going to start leaving you. A, fr hours no, of see, voice a friend notes of mine. The important bit at the end. But a friend of mine communicates with another friend of hers, and it is through thirty. Their podcasts. It's thirty-three minute voice notes. Uh -huh. Okay, and that's ludicrous. Right. That's ludicrous. like that's. But I, you know I what? Mean, I'm grand with your thirty-second ones. But for like... somebody, for example, who's I have a friend in Australia. And we do voice notes. And it's so nice to hear her voice every other day. And they're just small notes checking in. Might be about the weather, asking how somebody is. But I press play and there she is. And I think it's lovely. I think it's a really That nice is nice. Thing. And when you're on a different time zone. Before we go, can I ask you, uh, they're talking about in the front of the papers today, it said that Dancing with the Stars has got one season left and it's gone. 
Well, I thought last year was the last season. All right, no, I it's told, this year. Yeah, apparently And you were is. told, so, and this could be it. You loved it, didn't you? I, uh, I use the term love very loosely. <laughs> was it I good found experience, it though? extraordinarily difficult, OK? Right. Extraordinarily difficult. But I'm glad, I don't regret doing it. I made some lovely friends. Um, and I had abs for the first time in my life. Done not anymore, but but, but then well, when you're cleaning the floor with all the people. There you go. Your last. You got to get involved with it now. What? Maya Dance loved with it. the stars. Yeah, I'm starting a rumor no, that you're I'm doing it. I think it's going to be amazing. My dove, listen. Thank you so much for coming in this morning and mopping up the sick and everything. The legs look amazing. Apologies for the smell. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I'm going to be in trouble by saying that I send voice notes while I'm driving. I don't. Not when I'm actually driving. Just when I'm in the passenger seat. He doesn't. He doesn't. Up oh, next, we're styling that wardrobe staple, my favourite, black leggings. <laughs> Plus, sex educator Jenny Keane helps our female viewers and our male viewers here, reach the big O. We'll talk to you very shortly. Yes, please. Yes, exactly. <laughs>are talking about black leggings. And Lorna Duffy is here to explain it all to us. Good morning yes, to you, good Lorna. Morning. How are you getting on? Good. Black leggings and how to wear them this autumn. Even for a day I'm night? I'm here to save the day. Daytime, nighttime, school run, date night. Everything. There's okay. everything there. Everything. Okay. Well, Holly Willoughby, is she a fan? Holly Willoughby, uh, she loves a black legging. She loves a black jean. Um, and she likes to sort of dress it up and style it with a blouse and a shirt, obviously, for work. So here, obviously, we've gone for a nice sort of a blouse style tucked into a nice pair of black leggings. Here, as you can see, we've gone for quite a plain legging. I really like these for two reasons. Firstly, they're really high-waisted. And secondly, they have pockets which is yeah. not something you come across across quite regularly with a typical uh, legging. So these ones here are from the stall market. They're really, really stretchy, um, but they're also quite fit. I think there's nothing worse than a slightly baggy pair of leggings. Like, I think they do need to be skin tight. They've lots of stretch um, and they're absolutely gorgeous. So these ones here are available from a size small to an extra large. And again, that spandex style is just perfect. See with the pocket, can you see the inside of the pocket though? When you everyone... can't, try okay. to test it. Now that's one of my little pet peeves. Okay. There's nothing worse. Drives me demented. You can't, Tommy, try that out. And also I have to say with the bottoms of them, they're not too stuck to either. So you can't yes. get away with them feeling like leggings, but looking a little exactly. bit like a trouser. That's exactly. So they look like a trouser, so obviously it kind of helps with that dressy look that yeah. we've gone with on Yomiko today. And um, so beautiful sort of blouse. I love the bow style for see on this silk blouse is adorable. Really, really nice. Perfect for a smart casual look. Even for the office if you wanted to as well. Jazz it up a little with with this gorgeous little belt. Love a statement belt. Absolutely beautiful. And a mulberry um, type bag. Yeah, so kind of a mulberry type. So it's this beautiful leather bag. Again, love that gold strap. You can go for a clutch look if you want. We've gone, you can obviously go for the crossbody if you wanted to as well. Uh, beautiful ring. So all of our jewellery um, in this look here and our next look are from Tar Jewellers. Lovely nine card gold pieces. I just love layering rings. Yeah. Uh, really, really nice. Um, but again, beautiful pieces and a little bit of sparkle wow, for our dressy sparkle, look with our beautiful beautiful um, sort of um, stud earrings here as well. They're lovely and dressy with the shoes Really well. nice and I love these little black strap sandals. So all of our shoes this morning are from Murphy's shoes but yeah, they finish off the look nicely. Very so nice. There's someone I wouldn't think of taking, you know, everyday style tips from. You've gone with Lady Gaga. I know. So yeah, we're going all out with this one. So you wouldn't usually go for Gaga now or I wouldn't usually go for Gaga when I'm kind of thinking about kind of things on the style you know. side. However, the blazer legging look that she was wearing here is basically what we have recreated today. Similar print-wise as well, but again, that oversized blazer, huge, huge trend of the season. Uh, Balenciaga, Versace, you're seeing it everywhere. Uh, everyone on the catwalk. So lovely style of leggings again. So we've gone for a little bit of a different look here. We've gone for that ribbed detailing. The biker just style above that leggings. Knee. Exactly, Marin. That biker style is just lovely. I'm a big fan of the biker style. Even, um, you know, that sort of leather look, legging with the biker style, with that rib detail. Really, really nice. Um, so yeah, so we kind of mixed it up a bit, but again, it's a really, really nice fit. Lots of sizes, again, available in this one here. And it's just a nice high waist, and mm. yeah. And really you're showing nice. it off there with, I suppose, the top, the cami top, which you've got tucked in. Mm. It does go down exactly. A yeah, so you can you know dress it up, dress it down. So here again, the overall look, you know, you could definitely you know nice for a date night, a dinner date, catch up with the girls, whatever it is. Uh, lovely little lace cami top. Again, you could obviously tuck it into the leggings mm. if you wanted to. But you know, the cami top, whatever season, daytime, nighttime, mm -hmm. it's definitely a wardrobe staple. Um, and this lovely little blazer, just print. 
the shoulder yeah, detailing, the cinch detailing on the, the arms, everything. I absolutely love it. Um, beautiful pair then of quartz as well. Um, just quite stylish again. Obviously, we've had the strap kind of sandal and now just mix it up then for a slightly dressier look. Uh, we've gone for a really nice quart as well. Beautiful. Um, and then, of course, here, so you had our studs and now we're going for a little pair of um, gold hoops. I think the gold just ties in nicely just with that colour, I suppose that new colour in the blazer as well. Really, really yeah. nice. Um, beautiful. And then we've also got this gorgeous um, sort of interlock uh, love pendant as well. Um, and then a lovely matching ring and a matching the ring and the bracelet. Sweet. I love my little matchy pieces. You I really went for it today. As well, but just in general, if you're like me, everything has to match. Everything has lovely. to match. Lovely. Oh, really, really, really nice. Thank you. Yeah, Absolutely super. beautiful. Now, the next celeb, I think she owns every style of black legging in the entire world. It's I Kate agree. Beckinsale. She, doesn't she just She wears know? every... She's like, always wearing black leggings. She's wearing a simple, casual, everyday look. And she looks fabulous. She looks absolutely stunning. So here we're focusing on a typical legging with knit. So it could be a knit jumper, a long kind of oversized knit cardigan. Obviously here on Audrey, as you can see, we're going with that cardigan look. So with this style of legging, so we've got this casual look and I'm gonna show you how you can dress it up with our next look here, but love it for a few different reasons. Firstly, it's really nice and fitted. We've got that lovely high waist. Again, it's extra, extra high. It's really kind of accentuating and showing off that really nice curve. It's really, really feminine. The leggings are like a, a Kardashian sort of waist trainer it's, yeah, it's, is what it's they almost look like. Yeah, it's almost a sort of like a corset style. Right. So it's quite different, which is why I like it. So it really, really caught Can my you eye. Train in them? Really not. I'm gonna say just, no, Tommy. No, I'm just okay. I'm gonna say no on that one. Uh, you could try it out though if you wanted to. Okay, I mean, look, I mean, it's a first time yeah. for everything. Okay. Love this um, sort of oversized knit cardigan. Again, long line, you've got a bit of colour in there, pop of colour, absolutely gorgeous. Um, Polo look is here is from Get That Trend. Slight sort of subtle rib detailing then on this bodysuit here. Uh, really, really nice. Um, and again, obviously we've had that sort of flowy cami top. Bodysuits are perfect yeah. as well. Really, really nice to go with a pair of leggings. Gorgeous accessories here from Temple Wolf. Beautiful silver North Star hoop earrings. A little bit of sparkle. Absolutely stunning, and we've got a lovely sort of layer. So this is actually one necklace, Star Moon um, necklace here as well. Beautiful, and then an absolutely gorgeous um, silver North Star ring. And you really picked up the constellation points. details. The silver there is mm. actually in the runners yes, as well. Of course, again, all the matching pieces. Absolutely, I love these. So they're sort of a chunky style white runner, really casual. You could maybe, you know, school run, perfect, on the go, running around. They're stylish, but they're also comfortable, which is a win-win. Really, you. really nice. A pair of Calvin Klein's gorgeous. <laughs> Thank Lovely you so look. much. Thank you, Audrey. We're gonna our inspiration here. Sure, everyone's yeah. always looking at her on Pinterest. Yeah, she's just this everywhere. is Hayley Bieber. Isn't she just everywhere? Hayley Bieber. People are mad for this one, Tommy. <laughs> Who's Hayley? Oh, she's obviously Hayley married, to, yes. married to Justin. Justin. Yeah, she's a, Justin's, Justin's wife. sister. No, <laughs> definitely not his sister. Yeah, okay. Definitely not. That would be wrong. So here we're looking at two things. Obviously, we've got the black legging. Mm. We've got a pop of collar, and then again, we've got that really nice oversized blazer. So again. Everywhere at Fashion Week, Dior, Alexander McQueen, that pop of colour, blazer, legging look. It's absolutely everywhere at the minute. So again, we've had that sort of everyday casual style with those leggings, that corset style, and now we're showing you a slightly dressier way okay. um, to, for you to wear them as well. So not quite the gym now, Tommy, for the training. No, well, but this is a second option know. if you wanted to uh, go, out, go all out. So really nice. So I just love that vibrant orange. I think as well, people think, you know, all in winter, it's time to just take out all the blacks and greys and navies. Absolutely not. Go for the bright colours, go for the vibrant shades. Beautiful nice look here. Yeah. Um, and it's slightly dressier, obviously, you have that rush, kind of ruched detailing with um, the earlier blazer on Ursa. It's a slightly more dressy, so even for maybe the office, you know, yeah. perfect look for that as well. Along with another bodysuit on this one as yes. well. Yes, so bodysuit, this is a slightly lighter one, slightly more casual, plain, no rib detailing here, but again, absolutely stunning. It really finishes off that overall look, ties in nicely uh, with those black leggings as well. Love this little ring, gold snake, matches in really nice with our gold snake bangle, uh, and of course, that go gorgeous gold pendant necklace. A nice little cool. statement necklace, obviously, it's got no print or any kind of crazy detail yeah. going on with the outfit in general, so I think it really stands out and finishes it off nicely. And they've just gone for a nice, simple pair of, uh, not too high, 
uh, yeah. black sandals, which are quite nice. So again, mid -length. like the office or something like that, or maybe an autumn wedding or something. Definitely just a staple when it comes to shoes. So, so yeah, beautiful. Very Thank nice. you so, so much. So much. Thought you could do so much with black leggings. Ah, there you that. go. You, know, you can even You're head straight to the training after. Just going yes. straight to the gym. Exactly. Yeah. So, if you wanted to, you definitely could do that. I'm sure. Perfect. <laughs> Sorry, Duffy. Thank you so much Thanks for that so this much. morning. Thank Cheers. Thanks now, coming up next, I am waiting. This is going to be the same color as my top holistic sex, sex educator, Jenny Keen, is here uh, next with some great tips for men and women all about the big O. We're going to talk to you very shortly. It's delighted. <laughs> You're very welcome back to the show. Now we are going to be talking about things of an adult nature now, so time to distract any little ears listening. And to I'm off. going to. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> see, you guys, anyway. see you later. I don't... He doesn't need it's to know anything, guys. He knows everything. Holistic <laughs> sex educator Jenny Keane is here to talk about the big. Oh, Jenny, it's lovely to have you. How are you doing? Yeah, it's amazing to be here again. <laughs> it's lovely to have you here. Now, there was a recent uh, so study that was published in the Journal of Sexual Medicine, and it was mm -hmm. from a company, Linus, and it says that there are, in a recent study, it found that there were three types of female orgasm. In your, like, we all know the seven <laughs> erogenous zones. I'm getting straight in there. We all know from friends, the seven zones okay, the, the, with yeah. Monica. Are there three types of orgasm? Well, first think? of all, I would say there's the whole body is an erogenous zone. Like, if you have a body, your whole body is a pleasure playground, right? So, I mean, for how long was friends, right? <laughs> We're evolving. Yes. <laughs> Um, and what I would say is, is that in this particular study, they, they say there's three types. They've categorized them. So uh, there's actually more than that, than those types. I've, I do a workshop called Orgasm Online, and I, I tell women the, the, the amount of orgasm there are. We name them. But there's definitely way more than three. They're categorized into three. Into so the there's name. actually more than three. So it's not even just a myth, this whole thing, no? Yeah, there's way, <laughs> there's way more than three. <laughs> there's way more like, than three. Like, how do you even categorize them, then? Lucy, See, if you need to chat, just let us know, okay? We'll right, sort it all out. I told her I was doing this today. She said, you could do with a bit of help. <laughs> <laughs> Needs a bit of help. I'm recording this and yeah. I'm giving it to the housemate so, later on. So this study is actually referring to a particular vibrator that has been used to collect data of women's orgasms. And they've categorised the, um, the types of um, pelvic floor contractions that women are experiencing. And they've categorised them into three different types, right? Um, but that there's more orgasms available to everybody, basically. And even for men, right? Most men only experience what we would call like a tension release orgasm or um, an ejaculatory orgasm. But even for men, there's more orgasms available to you. But most of us just don't know about that because because we've never been educated, right? We don't know how our body functions. Most women have never actually looked at their vulva unless there's something wrong, right? But to actually just like look at your vulva and be like, where are all my parts? How do they all work? Where do they all fit together, right? Um, so like get the mirror out. People should do mirror. that. Yeah, no, I, I recommend that all of the time uh, because a lot of the time, because the sex education that we have is fear-based, right, that we grew up on, when it's fear-based, when it's... Um, risk based right we only tend to look when there's something happening and there's something unusual and there's something something wrong basically right we put a lot of fear on even engaging with this part of our body if you have never looked at your own vulva before how do you expect to have to access the amount of pleasure that's that's possible for you right because yeah. it's still to kind access. of taboo even with yourself like you know to be comfortable in your own skin mm -hmm. i'm sure this, this like it might be awkward is it uh, Do some people kind of say it's awkward to just whip out the mirror? Yeah, well, it's absolutely. I think it's very vulnerable to do that, yeah. right? And I think when when you when you don't receive sex education, when it, when there's a lot of fear around looking at your body, right? And you know you're looking for the problem because that's what you've been told to look for. Because sex education is about the fear of STIs, the fear of getting pregnant. What's wrong down there? Rather than pleasure based education, mm. which which looks at, you know, here are all your body parts. Here's how they function. Here's how to act access pleasure, here's the techniques for accessing more pleasure, and here's how you can access even more pleasure, right? Yeah, because that's the thing. It's not something that we're ever 
thought about, yeah. whereas we are with certain other parts of our body. Now, some studies have found that men can reach orgasm 90% of the time, but for women, it could be just 50%. Mm. So is there, let's, the female orgasm, there's been books written about it since the 70s, but it wasn't something that it was ever really taught as something that was important. And it's not something certainly like that when I was growing up was very important. It was always more about the boys. I suppose that's just personal experience or whatever. It is changing. Do you think women are now going, okay, well, this is about me too, and are starting to ask for what they want, or are they kind of too embarrassed to say to their partner, okay, this isn't working for me? I think we're all, I, I, at least in my world, right? Like I'm educating women and I'm educating mostly women at the moment. In my world, I do believe that that's changing. I think it's, it's an, it's an, it's, it starts off, it starts at getting educated about your own body first, understanding how your body works, how your body functions, what you like, what you don't like, how, you know, what, what causes arousal in your body and um, what types of touch your body responds to. And then being able to communicate that and express that to another person if you're sharing um, intimacy with that person. All of those things are skills that you develop slowly over time. I think there has never been a time in our life where we have been able to access this information um, easy, right? Like or, uh, easier. And whereas now being online, I know from my workshops, like I have thousands of people in my workshops. I did a workshop last week called Going Down and it was all teaching people um, techniques on how to touch mm -hmm. your vulva and um, techniques for oral sex, how to ask for what you want. And there was thousands of people in this workshop, right? Do you, so, so are you encouraging you know, to, to mention it to your partner. Oh, like, so it's yeah. not about or even getting your partner to watch something a like that. Actually, there are so many people who joined with their partner. So I obviously don't, okay. I don't take my pants off, right? Like, I, just to say this okay. to everybody at home. <laughs> Good to know, we yeah, had okay. We had grapefruits. <laughs> <laughs> and I had actually one person being like, I have now Well, then you had cucumbers. Can we see this for one second? I think cucumber. we've got something here. This is me, Jenny King, the woman who got sex work, caused a cucumber <laughs> shortage <laughs> in Ireland. Look at you. That was for the blowjob <laughs> workshop. <laughs> <laughs> oh my so God. grapefruits are going to be in shortage now as well. Yeah, okay, they, great they were know. in shortage last week. The cucumbers were in shortage the week before. I mean, you're <laughs> a busy girl. The green you know? must love you. <laughs> I need an affiliate link <laughs> for Instagram. <laughs> but this is, again, when we talk about this, it is about discovering what you like yourself, but then being able to communicate. We have to start uh, talking to each other, right? Absolutely, yeah. And knowing all the parts of your body as well. Like, a lot of women don't know where their G-spot is mm. or, like, the kind of G-area is. A yeah. lot of women don't know. They've never, you know, touched their own cervix, you know? Mm. Um, and, and it's just being able to open this conversation up to be like, there's nothing wrong with this. Well, right? listen, you're brilliant at opening... <laughs> opening it up. You know, it's great to have you with us here this morning. And thank you, we've run out of time. So, Jenny Keen, you can find you on at hello, or hello, Jenny Keen. Great to have you You had that locked and loaded. <laughs> you had that locked and loaded. Listen, that's thank all you, we have Jenny. For today's show with Pamela Laird and lots more coming up tomorrow. It's great to have you with us. See you tomorrow from 7. <laughs>